Good morning. Woo, welcome to the little country church early edition. Good to have all of you here. I'm excited to be here. Uh, what, what a joy to be back in church. I've been gone for 10 days, longest I've ever been away from in 16 years from you guys. And uh, we, many of you know, we took a bike ride up to Carolinas, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia. 10 days, 8 days in the rain. Uh, you know, if I'm on a bike, it looks like it's going to rain, and it sure did. And 55 to 70 degrees, great. Uh, but for me, it was a, a bucket list, you know, to get, be able to do something I, I have not done my life to make that many miles in so sh uh, short time. We went all the way from here, me and Jay did, to Alabama. We were invited by another church to go, another group of folks. So we connected with them, and uh, it, it was just an amazing. I mean, I know many of you have been to the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, the uh, Appalachians. I, I know why now they're able to get away with cooking moonshine. <laughs> First, you can hide anything up there. And then the, uh, the fact that the smoke is just constantly coming up from the mountains. You know, you don't know what smoke is, is smoke, you know. And uh, so we, we had a great time. I'll tell you a quick story before we move on. We, we, on Sunday morning, we decided, we got to go to church. Now, uh, I wasn't raised up in church, but, but I, I'm, I'm familiar with small churches. And, I, you know, in my heart, I'm saying, you know, we got to build a church. We got to grow the churches. And Houston has so many mega churches. And not trying to be uh, mega, but I just wanted, always want to grow the church. But, man, I found out what, what a blessing it was to have small churches and small communities. Uh, they're so necessary. And many times we almost put them down with our language. Like, you know, if you're a small church, somehow you don't connect or belong. You're not doing the right thing. It's not true. Small churches are needed in small communities. They're needed. Now, we need to keep growing. Amen. But they're needed. Yesterday, the little country church, I did a, 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 a wedding in, in early morning, and then I did a funeral in the afternoon. So, I mean, you can't go and our expense is so low, you can't go rent a mega church to do something. You just can't do it. Need, little churches are needed for a rally point. They're needed for uh, blessing, the community, together. So we pulled into a church, and it was raining. Matter of fact, we, when we pulled into a driveway, where were we? Do you know? Somewhere in Tennessee. There are so many Baptist churches in North Carolina and Tennessee. I mean, five out of six churches are Baptist. They're everywhere, man. I mean, it's like you couldn't meet anybody. They were more Baptist than people. So we, we pull in this, this driveway, and it's raining. We're trying to find a church Sunday morning, I mean, and trying to get in. And we, this is, there was an independent Baptist church on the hill, and there was a free will Baptist church in, down here. And they shared the same driveway. And their parking lot's connected. And, and I'm looking at this thinking to myself, <clears throat> why is there a need for one down here and one up here? Well, the old man on top that was parking the car, <clears throat> excuse me, told us. He said, I used to go to that church down there, but them women argue and fuss too much. He said, I can get that at home. <laughs> he said, so I came up here on the hill to have church with the rest of and I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to go to either one of these churches. This is not where I want to go on my own on Sunday away from Little Country. So we went on down the road and found a church called Shady Valley uh, Baptist Church. And we pulled in. There was a, some of you might have saw the pictures. This little pastor with a little suit on in there. And we just wanted to make a difference. So what is it, 10 or 12 of us, uh, Jay, I'm trying to remember. And we walked in, and boy, did we make a difference. <laughs> And I thought to myself, I wonder if 10 or 12 bikers came in here, would it make a difference in the atmosphere? Would we still sing as loud? Would we still praise God as much? And that's what's important. Well, when it's finished, and I'm not used to hymnals, but uh, they, we had to go to, you know, sing out of this one, and one, two, and four, and, and uh, we, then she switched to the gray hymnal, and then she went back to a burgundy one, which was a smaller one than the first burgundy, which was thicker, and we're hunting for books and trying to sing along with them. And when it's over, she came down and we whispered to her, she said, that's the best singing we've heard in this church in years. <laughs> we was loud. You've been on them bikes a while, you're going to be a little bit loud. Matter of fact, you can't even hear yourself, you know, so you're real loud. Cause he... <laughs> I looked over at Jimmy Veron, and I, said, and I saw them little old ladies looking at us. I said, Jimmy, look at them little old ladies. They like us. <laughs> I said, they're going to feed us after church. I promise you they'll feed. Showing up after church, they fed every one of us. We got food. It was, it was just good. But I, I was thankful to be in a place where we can make a difference. And I thank God for the smaller churches and, uh, and those communities that are making impact. And they're growing the best they can. But I just thank God for the impact that they've made because they're, they're necessary. Amen? Amen. 
Good to be home. We got guests in the house, Mike. Amen. Amanda, wave at me. We got you some homemade bread. Hi, Amanda. Thanks for coming. Give them two loaves. I see a whole bunch of them there. Amen. Give them at least two loaves. Good to have you here, Amanda. Anyone else first time here on a Sunday morning? First time you've been in church on a Sunday morning in a long time. Okay, I won't do that one. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Amen. What a special day. The song y'all did, Dick, had to do with a banjo. I thought of my dad. I was just home in Alabama, and I saw the well house that my dad used to sit on and play banjo. We didn't bother him when he was back there. That was his private time. And so if he was playing the banjo behind the house, on the well house, you left Pop alone. And he'd, play, he'd get back there and play it because it was his time of solitude and time to be alone. So thank God for... For fathers, I'm not here today to tell you what your dads ought to do, should have do, could have done. That's not my, my goal. I just want to remind you about being a dad today and the importance of that. And for many of you whose father, like my dad, who has gone on uh, to remember them, amen, and give God thanks for them. Would y'all give the band a hand as they leave? I was trying to land that on Naya right there, <laughs> cover him up. How you doing, JJ? You ready for Children's Church? Lord bless the children and the teachers walking from the sanctuary. There they go. We're going to have a powerful kids camp. I want to thank God for uh, the staff and volunteers of Little Country while I was out of town. We've had over 400 kids already at camp. And I heard Pastor Kenneth did a really good job last week. He was so excited to be with you. And I did watch the uh, Sunday morning service. Was proud of him. And to all the dads out there, my my father-in-law has now moved to Utah, Pop. uh, Happy Father's Day. Amen. To so many that have have, uh, gone on. Got your Bibles? Uh, Cheryl, let's start down with the verse Luke 23. Luke 23, verse 44. Luke 23, verse 44. Over the last, and it's good to have uh, young people here who are celebrating with their dads. You came to church today because, and I, I thank you for doing that. By the way, if you get a chance to ride a scooter to North Carolina and you do the dragon's tail, that's fine. But don't forget the moonshiner, the bootlegger, the copperhead, the diamondback, and 60 miles of the snake. I mean, it's like everything up there is a twist and a turn. You know, we ride a lot of times around here to go to Kerrville or Arkansas somewhere to ride a few curves. Up there, it's like, (sighs) 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 you just, it it, it doesn't quit. It doesn't quit. You think it's going to be over. And then next thing you know, a dog runs out in front of you and it's, (gasps) it's just, so, and that happened three times I counted. So it was, it, was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing time to be away. Are you comfortable? I'm so glad to be here with you. I love this house, love this church. Enjoyed last night. A, uh, a crew of us went over to Sulphur, Louisiana, and spent some time with David Huff, David and the Giants, in a church there. And it was just rocking. I'm telling you, they had a full band. Many of you are, uh, older folk in here. You're familiar with uh, uh, I Love Lucy, the show. Little Ricky is, uh, was in that show uh, the little little dude that played the little boy, his name is Keith Thibodeau. Keith was playing drums last night. And, uh, man, what a drummer. What a drummer. He guy was phenomenal. So I uh, really enjoyed being there with David. He sent me a text last night when it was over. He said, hope to see you in October. So, of course, you know he loves to come for our conference. We've been talking about the seven last sayings of Christ on the cross. Seven. And so I thought, okay, it's Father's Day. Lord, do I, do I go away from this or do I finish it? And God says, you ought to finish it. You've been doing it for two months. And uh, so as I'm walking through, I realize what a Father's Day message this is. Did you know before the little Hebrew children, they were taught to pray. All through, that's why when I say, when, when you read Scripture, it says raise a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart. We as Americans take that as raise them in church. But that's not what it's saying. It means raise them in the way of the Hebrew, 
Amen. And they'll teach them in a way. They already know church. They already understand church. They, they understand the synagogue and getting together in prayer and things. That's, that's a given. It doesn't mean raise them in church. Because I meet a lot of parents go, I raised my kid in church and look at them. They backslid. They run off. And they do what is that? I don't know. I thought God told me if I brought them up in church. That ain't what it meant. It meant show them at home. Show them at work. Show them at church. Show them at, at wherever you're at how to live for God. So every night before a, a Hebrew would go to sleep, which would be Jewish also, they were taught to pray. Many of us, we would pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And there's nothing wrong with re- repetition sermons uh, or, or, excuse me, uh, prayers as long as you mean, mean them. But the Hebrew children were taught to pray this way. Their prayer was simple. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So when we get to the end of the seven sayings on the cross, only Luke records Jesus' last saying. After he said it was finished, he said something else. It was now about the sixth hour, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, excuse me, from, from nine to the ninth hour, which would be three. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So before Jesus passed, he prayed the prayer that every Hebrew child learned to pray. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathed his last. Father, I thank you for the word. It's so powerful. It's so intimate. It touches us where we're at. I pray you open our hearts up to receive this Father's Day. In Jesus' name, and everyone said Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Say the prayer with me. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It wasn't, it wasn't God, into, into your heart, into your mind, into your uh, head. It was in your hands. I want to give you my spirit. Well, when I think about the hands, you know, as, as a, I'm 58 years old, I can tell you the older I've gotten, the smarter my dad has become. How many realize that? When, when you're 16, 17, they're like the dumbest people you ever met. You can't believe they're really your parents and you came from them. But as you get older, your parents should get smarter. You start realizing how wise they were. And, and so when I think about the hands, the hands, there are many varied ways we use the hand and the hands in our everyday speech and relationships. Some of you can't talk without your hands. Let me tell you, as a biker, hands are very important. You know, uh, when I, I, I played, I was a tail gunner. I've never been a tail gunner. That means I'm the last guy in the crew of bikes. So when I, when I see a signal to get over, I get over. So I help the other bikes get over. I block. I'm running blocker. I like running blocker. So I, I, I feel that. But hands are important. But when we, we're taught that if you see something on the road, you take your foot and you point it out. Well, I'm running with a bunch of guys that have a little bit different uh, uh, signals. So they, they, they pointing. They, they point. So when it was time for me to get over, one guy in the front would, ca- would call the guy. They had them headsets with them phones on them. I guess it's a Baptist thing. I don't know. But, but anyway, they, 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 then they called the other one in the back who was in front of me. So we need to get over. And he, he'd point, get over. So when he'd throw that hand out, I, I'd move on over. I was starting to figure this out, coaches. But I'm used to the foot. But he'd throw the hand out. Well, that works okay until you see somebody's blown tire in the middle of the road up front. And all of a sudden, the guy, instead of taking his foot and doing it, takes his hand and he points. Well, he's pointing at the tire in the road. I think he's telling me to get over. You see how signals can get a little messed up. I had to have a little discussion with him at the next stop. After hitting, almost hitting tires a few times. You don't, you don't, you don't have to point that way. Many people, they, they can't talk without their hands. Hand, tie the hands, you mute them. For example, when you greet someone, what do you do? Well, you shake hands, and we do it. We got to do it coming and going. You, some of you shook hands coming in. Some of you going to shake hands going out. Often the kind of handshake you receive is, is your first introduction to what sort of person you're dealing with. Are the hands cold? Are they warm? Is the handshake firm, too firm? Is it limp? Ooh. Uh, is, it, is it tentative? Uh, we like to receive 
even-handed treatment. You hear the word even-handed. If you're good with your hands, you're said to be handy. If you're not handy, then you're considered all thumbs. It's kind of a gross thought to think about having all thumbs, but, but I've seen people that way also. Even when we help others with our hands, subtle messages are given. It makes a big difference whether you're giving a hand out or you're getting a hand up. Expressions change over time. It used to be that all clothes were handmade. So if you got clothes from somebody, they were hand me downs, right? I used to wear hand me downs when I was in school. I had a, a young a friend down the road named Randy who, when he outgrew his clothes, I got them because we couldn't afford clothes. So I got his hand me downs. What did that do? He was a grade ahead of me in school. His name was Randy. He was he was a, a part of a, a disability group. I, I really like Randy, and 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 I would protect him at school. I wasn't protecting him. I was protecting the clothes I was going to get from him. So I wouldn't let people beat him up because those were my jeans. That was going to be my new shirt, you know. So you, had, you couldn't pick on Randy because I was going to get his hand-me-downs. If we're happy or appreciative, we put our hands together and clap. If you want to feel connected to other people, you join hands with them. If you're in love, you hold hands. Everybody wants to hear about something firsthand as opposed to secondhand. A secondhand car is not as desirable as a new car, so much so that the car dealers invented a new term, previously owned vehicle uh-huh and we bought it to raise your hands in anger is to make a fist to extend friendship is to offer a hand to pray you fold your hands or you offer them to God many of us as believers we lift our hands before him in worship as the scripture tells us to in Mark 14 41 the scripture says it is enough the hours come behold the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners in other words Jesus allowed himself to be put in the hands of others and when we read about this we realize that at the very end of his life he said father into your hands when you start reading about the cross the first words from uh, from him was father forgive them his last words was father into your hands but in the middle he said my god my god why have you forsaken me knowing that the cesspool of the sins of the world were poured upon them upon him so we understand all the things that he was going through he begins to yield himself to the one he called father for 12 hours jesus had been in the hands of the wicked men with their hands they beat him with their hands they slapped him with their hands they abused him with their hands they crowned him uh, with thorns with their hands they ripped out his beard with their hands they smashed him black and blue with their hands they whipped his back until it was torn to bits all that is behind him now wicked hands have done their part they've done all they can do and now Jesus returns to the father and he says I commit I commit my spirit. The word I commit, the word means to deposit something valuable in a safe place. It's what you do when you take the, your will and your most valuable possessions and you put them in the safe deposit box at the bank. Amen. I'm committing that which is so special to me, my spirit. They beat my body. They've taken my body. But my spirit, who I am, I commit to you. And my spirit, when you look and see that word, it's a phrase Jesus was talking about his very life, his personal existence. Now that his physical life was over, there was nothing to do to bring it back. Jesus committed himself to his father's hands for safekeeping. Father, I can no longer take care of myself. I place myself in your hands for safekeeping. That, that's a good understanding. That in our lives, there may come a time we say, God, I, I can't do anything else with this body. This body's gone. I commit my spirit to you. Prophetically, in the Old Testament, Psalm 31, verse 5 says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me. Buy me back. Purchase me back, O Lord, the God of truth. His physical sufferings had reached a climax. There was nothing else he could do. The pain now is unbearable. Breathing is impossible. The crowd gathered around him like vultures circling their prey. The friends of Jesus watching horror as his life ebbs away. Death rattles somewhere in his throat. And now we understand this was crucifixion. I find the word excruciating. Excruciating would be the word. Death by cruci crucifixion was excruciating. The word excruciating comes from the Latin word extrudius, which literally means out of the cross. When you say Man, that's excruciating. You're saying that pain came from the cross. It was like the pain of what Jesus suffered. You need be careful with that word. Don't just say it because you got a hangnail. And don't say it just because you stomped your little toe because you didn't turn on the light when you got up. Excruciating is, is all the pain that you can handle. It's from the cross. And he voluntarily gave up his life. That Satan didn't take his life. 
Death didn't take his life. He gave up his life. Christ was arrested, tried like a common criminal, beaten within an inch of his life. He suffered the terrible ordeal of crucifixion and died an agonizing death. And now he laid down his life. John 10, 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one, he's, he's prophesying about what's going to happen. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. You know why daddy loves me? Because I'll do anything I want that, that I can for my daddy. Let me help you about dads real quick here. Favor follows whoever favors the father. I got, I got five kids. I got three kids. I, you know, listen. It doesn't matter how many kids you got, but the one that's favoring you at the time is the one the father's going to favor. Well, that ain't fair. No, it's not. Please get over it. Please understand that. I don't care, Mama, if they're favoring you. Well, it's, I'm that way. Whenever a child favors me, even if they're not, they could be one of yours. I'm going to favor that kid. When Parker comes up here next to me, he, he's like my boy right then. You know, because he favors me. Whenever a child favors you, you're going to start favoring them. And so here Jesus said, you know why the Father loves me? I lay my life down for him. But he sent me here with a purpose. He sent me here with a mission. He sent me here to do, accomplish something, and I've done everything he's done for me. That's why the Father has favored me. He, he'll raise me back. I know if I die, he'll bring me back from the dead. Matthew 27, 50 says, And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And we know by Luke that loud voice was, Father, into your hands. I'm going to say one more prayer before I go to sleep. I'm fixing to go to sleep. You think I'm dying? I'm not. I'm, I'm just going to go to sleep. Father, into your hands. I've prayed it for 33 years. I commit my spirit. From all this, you draw several lessons. First, he knew it was time to die. Second, he wasn't afraid to die. And I've often said to you about death in my own life, I, I only ask for a heads up. I just want God to tell me, okay, you got 10 seconds. Just give me a moment. Just give me a, yeah, just that little brief, help me Jesus moment. I mean, I just I'll ask for it. And I don't know if I'm going to get it. But I can tell you this, it's going to happen to all of us. And he wasn't afraid to die. He, 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 he was embracing something. He died with his life complete. I told you a few weeks ago, he completed everything that he came to do. He died without anger or bitterness, not mad at the world. Well, oh, 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 hold on. Let me just, maybe we, we won't, maybe we can't. I did a funeral yesterday of a 57-year-old man who found out he had cancer in December and passed that quick. You, you don't know when the time is, but he knew it was his time. He wasn't afraid to, to die. I'm not there. Maybe you're not there, but I'm going to tell you that we've got to learn to die well. We've, got to, we've lived well. We've been blessed well. But when we get to the end, you, I, I hope I make it as clear to you as I can. Heaven is going to be an incredible place. And many of our, our friends and family are already there. That, that Things are going to shift and change. You can't be afraid of it when it happens. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm not being realistic, but I know when Jesus prepared to die, Living on the other side was better than where he was on the cross. I think there comes a time in life when the body breaks down in such a way that you even realize, and I hear you say it, it, it was better for them to go on. Amen. They're in a better place. Mm. He died with his life complete. He completed what he came for. He died without anger. To, not, to get to the end of life and not be angry, not to be bitter, not to be mean, not to be spouting. You know, I, I remember I, I read the story of a man... That, I've got to be careful with this story. A man was bit by a rabid dog. It was in the 1800s. There was no cure for rabies. The dog was foaming at the mouth, and they put the dog down. They knew the man was going to get it. They told the man, there's nothing we could do for you. You've been bit by a rabid dog. The man was kind of a contrary, mean old man to start with, and now the dog has bit him, and he knows that within, within the next few weeks he'll die an excruciating death. He grabs a piece of paper and he begins to write. And as he begins to write, the doctor looked at him and said, Sir, I want you to understand, it's going to be weeks before you die. Now, it will be excruciating when you die, but I want you to know it's going to be weeks before you die. So there's no need of you to write your will out right now. He looked up at that doctor and he said, Sir, I ain't writing a will. 
I'm writing out a list of people I'm going to bite before I die. <laughs> That's not the way I want to go. Can I get an amen? I don't want a list of folk I'm mad at. He died in complete control of his senses and his circumstances. He died knowing where he was going, back into the Father's hands. Everybody say the hands. I'm going back. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Max Lucado, who is such a, a wonderful writer, said of the death that, that he saw on the cross. He, when Jesus said, Father, the voice that called forth the dead, the voice that taught the willing, the voice that screamed at God, now says, Father. Father, the, the two are one again. The abandon is now found. The schism is now bridged. Father, he smiles weakly. It's over. Satan's vultures have been scattered. Hell's demons have been jailed. Death has been damned. The sun is out. The sun is out. It's over. The angel sighs. The star wipes away a tear. Take me home. Yes, take him home. Take this prince to his king. Take this son to his father. Take this pilgrim to his home. He deserves the rest. Take me home. Come 10,000 angels. Come and take the wounded troubadour to the cradle of the father's arms. Farewell, manger's infant. Bless you, holy ambassador. Go home, death slayer. Yeah, rest well, sweet soldier. The battle is over. Yes, my friend, he was the death destroyer. As Hebrews chapter 2, 14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives have been held in slavery by the fear of death. Nothing paralyzes you like fear. Nothing paralyzes you like fear. Fear will stop you from getting on an elevator. Fear will stop you from leaving the house. Fear will stop you from getting in a vehicle in Houston traffic. Fear will stop you from getting on your motorcycle and shoving up through curves in a rainstorm. Fear will hold you back. And when it happens, you've got to fight that. Fear will stop you from entering into, into a relationships with people again because you've been hurt by them. Fear does that. And when Jesus destroyed death, who held death? Be honest, Satan held it. Before Satan, there was no death. And when Satan enters the picture, now man has death. And we fear it. We fear these earth suits wear out. And we fear what's going to happen on the other side. Death. We fear what's going to happen to our children. And our children's children. We don't know, we, we want to be around somehow thinking that our presence is going to make things different for them. You know, I, my kids are dispersing. Your kids are dispersing. They, they, they're places, they go. And you got to let them go. And you got to not live in fear. But you got to have faith. God, I've I got faith that good things are going to happen for them. It's just a thought. When you understand that Satan holds the power of death. When Satan is no more, Death will be no more. Between now and then, Satan still rules in the realm of death. Men fear death with good reason. They're, they're entering a realm, if you don't know Christ, into Satan's control. But the death of Jesus spoiled Satan's power. As long as men stay dead, death was Satan's ultimate tool to keep them in chains. But one man changed all that. Before he even died, he called for Lazarus. Can you imagine hell shaking? We, we had hold of Lazarus and all of a sudden he's gone. He's out of the tomb and he's awake and he's sitting with Jesus in Mary and Martha's house. I don't know uh, Satan, something's going on. This, this Christ that is walking the earth, he has this power about him. And so when he's on the cross and hell is rejoicing and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit and hell's going, no, no, no. We got his spirit. We got him. And all of a sudden his spirit goes to the Father. And three days later, his body comes up out of the grave. And the scripture gives us this idea that he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave with him. That he entered the, the caverns of the damned. And he took away the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He says, Satan, I got that. Never lo no longer will my people have to fear death. They don't have to fear that anymore. Because there's going to be a, a better life from them. But this one man changed all that. Yeah, he died. But he didn't stay dead. He broke Satan's power. Then he tore off the bars of death. Now, no one need to fear it any longer. Death still comes. Death still comes. But for those who know Christ, death has changed its character. It is no longer the entrance into the dim unknown. Now it's the passageway into the light, into the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord.
Amen. It's such great peace of knowing. I don't know how I could do funerals without knowing this. I don't know how I could stand before you and before a friend and not be able to say that I will see Brother Havard again. I will see Ron Gant again. I will see so many people that are pa- right now, guys, and I don't know if they're watching, but Donna Hawkins called me. Many of you know Janie. Janie's in hospice care right now at Donna's house. Be praying for her. Yes, unless there's a miracle, there's no going back. And Janie sat in this church for 16 years. Amen. Been with me even longer than that. You've you, you got to believe God. And I can tell you, I know she loves him. So as we pass beyond the curtain, we live on and on. But it will not be as it was today. In that day, we're going to be brought to new life. I've always called it a trade up. Not with halting limp or wrinkled brow. Not with dimming eyes or faltering steps. Not with a twisted spine or runaway tumors. Not with bitter memories or faded dreams. Not with an amputated leg or injured heart. No, not, not with any of these that's going to happen. We're going to be clothed. He got us a new body. I'm, I'm not ready for it now, but when he gives it to me, I'm looking forward to this new body. I haven't ran since I was 16. Since they operated on my foot, I've not been able to run with a, with a fused foot. I get a new body. My sister who died in a wheelchair, new body. My pop who died in the bed, a new body. And again, I can't prove it. I need to say it again to you. I believe when we all get to heaven, we'll be 33. We'll all be about the same age. What's that mean? You get your hair back. Okay, I'll stop right there because I know I'm going to get into some private stuff now. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It was the sixth hour. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, the Roman soldier, seeing what had happened, gave God praise and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Then all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place. They beat their breast and they went away. Psalm 31.15 says, My times are in his I don't know how much time I got. But whatever it is, there's an expiration date and it sets in his hands. My purpose here on earth becomes even clearer. Hebrews 7.24 says, But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Just stand with me. How strong is his hands? The book of Isaiah tells us that with his hands, he met out the oceans. Here, David, real quick, open that. Pour it right here in my palm. There it is, that's good. So, when God created the earth, he said, that there's going to be the Pacific, that there's going to be the Atlantic, that right there is the San Jacinto River. He, he with the palm of his hand, he weighed out the oceans. Well, Pastor, you don't understand my problem. With the palm of his hand, he weighed out the oceans. Pastor, you don't understand what I'm going through. With the palm of his hand, he weighed out the oceans. Pastor, I'm struggling with this. With the palm of his hand, one hand he weighed out the oceans he carries us like lambs with his hands how powerful are his hands he said pastor I'm struggling being a dad you know when you get to be a dad many times it just happens you you didn't know it was going to happen and you know I'm not, I'm not the husband I wish I was. I'm not the dad I wish I was. I'm not, I, I, I have regrets and this, that. Don't we all? Don't we all? But I'm just going to rest in his hands this morning. And I'm going to ask him 
to give us all a fresh start. Give me an opportunity. I won't be... I don't want to be a submissive father. I want to be a, a teaching dad. See, it's, it's not my name that matters. It's my voice. When I'm dead and gone, it's my voice I want you to remember. It's a voice crying into a wilderness. Your voice, your voice is so important. Mama, your voice is important. Some of you moms have had to be mom and dad. I know that. But I'm here to tell you, you got to start seeing how big his hands are. So when Jesus said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He knew that he was going to be saved. One scripture says that you can't be plucked out of the hands of God. That once you get in them, his grip don't slip. Amen. You holding his hand ain't helping. Let him hold yours. Well, as a parent, I can tell you that if I got to hold my kid's hand, that kid ain't going nowhere. If that kid just comes up and grabs my pinky, well, that, that, that's, that's different. That kid got your pinky. Y'all, that's sweet. All of a sudden, next thing you know, that kid gone. He running through Walmart, stealing jelly beans. You better go snatch that kid. Get hold that hand. Now you ain't touching them jelly beans. Because <laughs> I got your hand. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. What a wonderful experience for me to tell you this. I do not know everybody in this room. I don't know you walk with God. I don't know where you're at. But it's between you and Him, and it's just my place to pray for you. If you've been out of the hands of God, you've been doing your own thing, don't you think it's time to say, God, take me. You hold my hand. I've been doing this holding it back and forth. It's time for you to hold my hand. I want to commit myself to you. And particularly speaking to your dads. Bet you, would you put your hand up so I can see it and pray for you? Amen. Thank you, sir. Man, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My goodness, there's some men. Any ladies in here? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Amen. With those hands lifted, let's pray this together. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, my life, my family. I give it over to you. It's been too big a burden for me to carry, so I give it to you because your burdens are light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Come on, give him a big praise in here. Into your hands, Lord, I commit my spirit. David, would you go over there and get that, that box on the other side? Every Father's Day, I say, Lord, now what am I going to do for our daddies? Uh, let me just mention, go ahead and just dump or open it up there for that on the table. Give me, give me a pair after you get it open. Need a knife? Got it? Just give me a pair there. Thank you, sir. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. I want the dads in here to come up in just a minute. I'm going to give you the opportunity to take this glove. But I want to say something to you, Dad. Dad, your hands are so important. They're so important. With them, we've held our children. Your hands secure your family. Your hands provide for their needs. With your hands, you're a mechanic. Oh, we got mechanic gloves, don't we? You got your gardening gloves. You got your, oh my God, there's germs, antiseptic gloves. <laughs> we got our carpenter gloves. My dad built his own house, added on it as he went. I took some of the guys up to see my pop's house. That he built with his own hands. My dad had to, he didn't take his truck down to the mechanic. He was the mechanic. When the tire went flat, it wasn't about just changing it. He would break the tire down in the part, he'd drive over it. Y'all remember seeing a guy drive over the tire and break the tire down in the, in the driveway, bust it apart and fix it. He didn't have people to run to like we do today. He was all those things. Dad, your hands are important. Amen. You're a carpenter. We celebrate your hands. Your future is in your hands. Now, I know it's in God's hands, but it's in your hands too. The future you make is in your hands. This church, Dad, is in your hands. Yeah, it's in mine, but it's in your hands. For this church to survive and grow and thrive, 
It's in your hands, Dad. It's important. When you teach by your time to God, you're teaching your kids with your hands. When you give, when you tithe and give offering, your kids notice that. How are they going to know to do it unless you do it? When you give of your treasure, amen, your time, all of those things, they're in your hands. I'd like for all the dads 50 and up to come up here and pick you out a set of gloves. I got them for all sides. Ladies, you can be seated. But, amen, I want all the dads to stay standing up. All the dads 50 and above, come on up here and get you a pair of gloves. Reach it and sort through. Go, go ahead, dig down in there. There's all kinds of gloves down in there. Hey, Coach East, you can dig down in there. That's gloves in the bottom of that thing, all different kinds. Dump it out if you need to. There you go. All right, all your dads, 49 and down, come on up here and get you some gloves. If you get a pair of gloves that don't fit, you can trade them in after church. I love these dads. I get our servant leaders to come up. We love you, dads. I want you to. You, I want you to take these gloves and listen to me. And I want you to use them. But I want you to put TLCC on them. Hang on to them. I. I get a pair of gloves. I start. I don't know what it is. I don't want to get rid of them. You know, and I got a couple of good leather gloves. And somehow somebody borrowed my truck and kicked one glove out the door. And I have one glove. And I, I don't want to get rid of that one glove. It's got the oil on it and the cut marks and all of that. It, it, it spared me so many different things. Amen. So I, I look at those gloves. And, I, and when you get a pair, start wearing them out. But I want you to remember this day. Look, dads. God gave you hands for a reason. Use your hands. They're not just for punishment. Hello. They to hold. Great joy in my life is just getting to embrace my kids, my grandkids. I'm excited about camp coming up for our kids. My grandkids are going to be here for camp. I'm going to go get them, get them here. Amen. Because camp's so important. Amen. So make sure you sign up. As David will tell you more. But if you need to tie the orphan envelope, amen. Again, the survival of this house is in your hands. Your giving is so important. No finances and no future. If you've not been a tither, learn to ask God. And again, you know, if you tithe, and you tithe for a month, and you say, Pastor, it, did, it didn't work, I'll give you your money back. I'm just telling you. I, I've never had anybody come say, I need my money. But I will give, I, if you prove to me that you've been tithing off of what, the money you make and you, and you ain't making anything, I, I, the scripture says, test me. If God say test me, okay, I'll take the test too. I've been tithing for 40 years and I've never once realized that, and I've, I've been to the lowest low that I've ever been, and yet I keep tithing because I know what God will do. He always pours it back on me. He says, test me and test him in this. Amen. Believe him for that. David? Yes, yes, yes. 
June nineteenth and twentieth, we got camp. Oh, okay. I gotta get excited about it. <laughs> we we want you guys to come out and volunteer with us. June nineteenth and the twentieth, Camp Holy Wild Ropes, um, in the cafeteria. Guys, I say it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it next week. Listen, if you want to get involved in the church, you have to get involved. <laughs> this is the reality. You have to show up. And so we want you guys to be involved, especially now that we don't have a midweek during the summer. Uh, part of that is so that we can get people involved, so that they have the energy and the desire and the want to. So come out, hang out with us, um, see Sister Lori or uh, Judy Deccan. On June 16th, Lift Bible Study. See, Miss Diane, it's today. She said today. See, I don't even know what day it is. Uh, July 5th through the 7th is a kids camp. Sign up now. That's going to be in the back. Um, I, but yeah, it's in the back right corner if you guys want to. Um, and if you don't have kids, sponsor somebody else's. Look, some kids won't go because their parents think, well, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to let people know. Look, if you sponsor them, just say, look, I want to sponsor a kid. Then all of a sudden now you're giving opportunity and destiny into somebody's life that may otherwise not be able to. So that's really, really important. That's all our announcements today. God, we're believing for jobs and better life. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail. Fi oh, my bad. Bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns. Debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. <laughs>